Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with expert series. I'm Dory Mincer. I'm owner of Revolutionize Retirement and your host for this series. So without further ado, let me tell you a little about Sarah Zeff Geber, who is an author, speaker, and certified retirement coach. And just as a preface to her background, Sarah and I met Oh, a number of years ago now, at, I can't even remember which positive aging conference it was and subsequent aging conferences. And we're also both members of the LPN, and I consider her a friend and a colleague. And I'm so delighted to have her with me. She actually did present one other time way back at the beginning of this series. But now with her book coming out, I thought it'd be a great time to have her back and have her really talk about, you know, her... Passion, really, is what it is. So Sarah's made raising awareness of the special challenges of solo agers her personal crusade, speaking and writing about it for the past six years. Her book, Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers, is available both as an e-book or a paperback. With her coaching, writing, and speaking, she helps solo agers understand what they need to do to prepare for the future, for retirement and beyond. Sarah has a Ph.D. in counseling and human behavior. She's an active member of the Life Planning Network, often referred to as LPN, and is on the leadership team for the NorCal chapter of LPN. She's also a member of the Transition Network, a national organization that supports women over 50 as they go through life's journey. A solo ager herself, Sarah is a native of the San Francisco Bay Area and lives with her husband and their canine companion in Santa Rosa. So, Sarah, I am so delighted to have you with us today. And I know, thanks. And I know everybody's in for a treat to hear you present. And as I mentioned, there are going to be some slides. And maybe we could start by just when and why, how did you become interested in this particular subset of the aging boomers? Yes, sure. I always tell this very true story that happened uh, to me about six years ago. I was listening to a friend of mine talk about the uh, time she had recently spent with her father-in-law back east, helping him cope with all of the things that he needed help with in as he moved into his early 90s and because her husband had um, a very demanding job and she was kind of consulting and had really her time was her own she was the one that was elected to go back there and spend really months at a time with him in upstate new york they finally decided that he needed to be in a good nursing home and Interestingly, they found one of the first greenhouse nursing homes. Those are the Bill Thomas Mm. developed ones and moved him in there. But the amount of time that this couple was spending taking care of their aging father, his aging father, made me start to look around. And as I looked around, I saw lots of my friends, colleagues, people I knew, talking about the time they were spending with their parents as they got older. And at one point I was driving and thinking about one of them, and I, and I all of a sudden I just had to pull over. And I said to myself, mm-hmm. who is going to do that for us? Mm-hmm. Because my husband and I do not have children, and a lot of our friends don't have children. We were originally called dinks, double income, no kids. Um, and now we're <laughs> retired and still don't have kids. So it became a real, as Story said, passion for me to look into that, to start doing some research. And what I discovered was that almost 20% of the baby boom population does not have children. Hmm. So that was quite an eye-opener in itself. And I decided, well, we need to, I need to start to open the eyes of people around me and people who are in this situation and people who care for people in this situation and see what kind of inroads I could make. So I coined the term solo aging 
And somebody asked me the other day, if, didn't I copyright it or something? And I said, no, I'm thrilled to finally, after all these years, this past year, I have heard people start to use it. Mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. people to use it. I want to, to be known as a solo ager and to be talk, and to talk about solo aging as a phenomenon that really needs a rising profile and for people to take notice that there are some special things going on. I think you're so right, and I I know over the years talking about it with you, I mean, you've opened my eyes to parts, and, you know, I remember even saying to you, and we'll talk maybe later about how it, it it's different in some ways. I mean, because I, I have a situation where I have a son, but, you know, I'm older, and he's young still, and, mm-hmm. you know, and many people might have children, but you can't count on them because they're all over the globe but it's still yes. it's still different but sim- could be similar in some ways and I think this whole issue of who's going to take care of me when I'm older or who's going to be there or what do I need to build in is part of what we'll be focusing on and I think it, it, you know it's so important that you're doing the work that you're doing yeah. well, tell absolutely. us more about and, the and statistics I, yeah oh go ahead sure yeah yeah, um, well, no, no. I was going to say I've yeah. learned so many from talking to so many people now that there are lots of people in the position of a solo ager, even if they do have kids. Because right. these days, kids, it's possible they're estranged somewhat. It's possible that they live 6,000 miles away. So you, you, a lot of people are a little leery about whether they are going to be able to count on their kids for support and, and the help that they need. So so this book, in a way, is really written for anyone that suspects that they may need to just set it up for themselves. So let me, let I, me go I want to. Un- I just want to underscore that for everybody because so, you know, it isn't just <laughs> for people who don't have children, but it's it's really a mindset, though, of thinking about, you know, what the challenges are of really needing to plan for this you know, really important life stage without yeah. necessarily having family to rely on. Yeah. So I just want to underscore that. But go ahead. And I'd like to make one more point before I move on, and that's that most people eventually look at me and say, well, what is a solo wager? How do you define that? And I do want to define it because by my thinking, solo wager also include married people. I am married. Dory is married. Mm-hmm. But we don't know. We don't have a magic crystal ball, and we don't know which one of us is going to predecease the other. So it's important if you don't have children, to my way of thinking. It's important for both people to plan to be a solo ager because you don't know who is going to be the, the true um, person living solo in the end. And one of you will, unless you both get hit by the same bus. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's important to plan. Well, let me move now into some of the statistics. And those of you who have uh, the slides in front of you will be able to see this graph, which illustrates the the rising number of women who don't have children. And it takes a look at what that at that curve from 1976, which is essentially which is about the time the baby boomers started having kids. I mean, yes, some had them when they were 19 and 20, but this is the start of this graph is 1976. And that reflects a 10% childless rate. That's been the childless rate from time immemorial because that is about the rate of women who are unable to bear children for whatever reason. So as you see this line moving up all the way all the way to 2008, and 2008, by the way, is about the point at which baby boomers passed beyond the child-rearing years. So in that time, we have seen almost a twofold increase in childlessness. Now, why is that true? Well, there are lots of reasons why childlessness is uh, creeping up, and some of them are very obvious. The, it started in the, in the 60s with the advent of the birth control pill, and all of a sudden, women had really complete and very safe and secure means of not having, of not getting, of not getting pregnant. So that was a big, big boost 
to this rising curve. And the other big boost, which is also probably fairly obvious if you look back into our history, is that the, the ability of women to educate themselves and get good paying jobs by which they could support themselves grew leaps and bounds during those decades. So lots of women had the ability to choose, I'm not going to have children. I'm going to have a career, or I'm going to travel around the world, or I'm going to be an artist. I, whatever choice was made, it did not, it no longer had to include children. So these are the two critical things that really gave boost to the, uh, the statistics around solo aging. So now, let's look at... Well, let's just stay with that for a minute. I mean, it really is interesting in terms okay. of, I mean, what, just thinking about since, you know, probably most people listening to this call are in the boomer or beyond population of just, you know, where that element of choice comes in and where, you know, and just how important that is. I mean, it's sort of like choice and also life circumstances. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. also people who wanted children but waited too long and weren't able uh -huh. to have. So, I mean, there's, you know, and so what I'll be interested in is sort of knowing if, you know, sort of what your sense is of people who, you know, are are steadfast in their decisions or those where there's maybe even mixed feelings about it. But we can, that's maybe thinking ahead, so we'll get to that. I just want to comment, Donna, if you could help me for a minute on the question and answer page. It, there's some link that you need to set so that if there are some questions that I can get them. So if you could check on that, I'd appreciate it. And I just want to remind people again, if you came in late, that this call is being pre-recorded and, but you still can submit questions or comments. And after the broadcast of the call, the questions will be sent to Sarah. So I just want to encourage people for those that are live on the call today, just know that you can go to the event page and you'll see either on the side or the bottom of the page a place where you can put your name, where you're from, and what your question is. And for those listening in at the broadcast, know that you can ask questions too. Okay? So go ahead. Sorry. Great. Okay. I'm going to move on to <clears throat> taking a look at the social network of parents compared to solo agers. Now, if this chart that I'm showing is has a, it's like a flow chart for those of you that are are just listening in, and it has parents kind of in the middle and their ties, of which they have many, many, many with their children and potentially their grandchildren and their children's friends and the in-laws. I watch this all the time when I when I visit with my friends who do have kids. Um, it, it, kids act as kind of a multiplier, and the complexity of this network will grow tremendously as kids get older and develop their own set of friends and ultimately get married, and then you have in-laws, and you have eventually and potentially grandkids. And, of course, some of those ties are, are greater than others, and parents have ties to their to their friends and their siblings in their community as well. But large families tend to have a very, very complex network. Now, I have some friends in the um, Silicon Valley area of California, where my husband and I moved from about three years ago. And it was fascinating to watch them develop a whole new social network when their kids got old enough to get married and begin families of their own. And these people, hard, we hardly ever see them anymore because they are so mm -hmm. caught up with taking trips and doing things with their their grandkids and now their grandkids' significant others and the in-laws, and that's their social support system. And I'm going to talk a lot about social support systems. Mm -hmm. And they come from all kinds of places. But for parents, they often come or at least include their children and their grandchildren. So these kinds of social support systems are often just not available to solo agers. So let's take a look now at a similar map for solo agers, which 
again, those of you looking at this can see that it's considerably sparser. You have solo agers who um, may or may not have a, a marital partner or a significant other, but their strongest ties are often to their friends and to their siblings and maybe to their nieces and nephews, often to their community. So a much simpler chart, none of the ties to kids and grandkids. The, the, it varies tremendously, of course, from person to person. The, and some solo agers can absolutely rely on their family. I have uh, one female friend who comes from a very large family. She has, well, not huge, but she has four sisters. There were five girls in the family. And all of the other sisters did get married and had kids, but this one sister chose um, to be a scientist, and marriage and kids were just not part of the program. So she has remained within close proximity and also close emotionally with her sisters and their offspring. So she feels pretty confident that her social support network will involve mostly her nieces and nephews and, and what siblings are, are still around as she becomes a much older person. So I find that that is the exception rather than the rule. Most people are not as close to their siblings, either physically or emotionally, but they do have a, a strong cadre of friends. And that's something that I'm going to emphasize strongly that you hang on to, is that strong cadre of friends if you are a solo ager. So that sounds are like kind of the, a yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a no, comparison of the two social networks. And it's really helpful to kind of flesh that out a little too because it's it's so interesting and and i think it's so important because you know even solo ages i mean when you think about the friendships that we have when we're younger and then maybe their friendships through school and but what i see a lot in my clients that are solo agers is as we get older the so so like i'm thinking of this one woman in particular her friends are all dying and mm -hmm. her kids are on the other coast. And so although she has children, she's divorced. So she's single and has been for, for many, many years. And the kids have been out west for many, many years. So she doesn't, you know, see them and doesn't, you know, can't really feel like she can count on them. But the world mm -hmm. shrinks. And I yes. was just even thinking in terms of people, well, she's an example of someone with parents, but, but just even thinking about the importance of that network. When kids are little, it's so different from when kids are off. And mm -hmm. I've had many people, you know, it's sort of like the changes that happen when you're not actively parenting. And in the same way, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of examples where people with pets often have a wonderful community of other pet owners. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know and sometimes that becomes the, the friend. And absolutely, group. these you know, these uh, social networks can spring up from almost any kind of group that you find yourself in or manage to create. But I, you know, the pet thing resonated so with me. I have two friends who have a tremendous social support system among the people that they see every day at the dog park. Right. And these people get together for dinners, and it's gone way beyond the dog park. <laughs> they have a they have yep. a Yahoo group, and they plan outings together, mm -hmm. and they leave their pets at home sometimes. <laughs> but yes, mm -hmm. it can spring from so many places. It can spring from your from your church or synagogue or place of worship. It can mm -hmm. spring from a a yoga class. It can spring from so many different kinds of activities that you might get into. So yeah, right. that but the social network is so so important, especially for solo agers who don't right. have the family to fall back on. Right. Okay, let me move into something a little different. I want to talk about what it is that family actually does for their aging parents. And that will give us an idea of the kinds of things that we as solo agers need to think about as we do our planning, our legal planning and planning for our later life when, as Dory mentioned, our world is going to shrink. I remember a few years ago, a mutual friend of Dory's and mine said something about 
I have this wonderful support system. We don't live near each other, but we get together a couple times a year. You know, we fly in, we take the train, and I just know that's going to continue the rest of our lives. And I thought to myself, no, it's not, because you live too far apart. It, yep. it, your world is going to shrink, and that's going to go away. It will die of its own weight because you won't be able to get to one another. That's just the reality of getting older. And the more people can get out of the denial on that and realize that that, that is what's coming, I think the, really the, the happier and safer we'll be. Right, so let me so talk right, about some Sarah. of the things. Let me talk about some of the things that adult children provide. And for those of you that are looking at the slides, this is the, it's the pie with uh, about seven different wedges here that all represent things that adult children do for their aging parents, regardless of whether those parents live in a retirement community that has care available. Because when I went in and talked to people in assisted living communities and continuous care communities, I discovered that still they depend a lot on kids. They depend a lot on whoever comes to visit. Depend on them for what? Depend on them to buy a new nightgown, a new toothbrush, pick up a medication, take them out for a meal. These are all things that when you go into a retirement community today, you will see that happening, especially on the weekend. Sit for a couple hours in the reception area of any retirement community, and you will see middle-aged people coming and going, mostly visiting their parents, their older relatives who are, are in there, often taking them out, but at least spending time with them. It's the kids. So here's what they do. Starting with the orange one that's about at 11 o'clock, medication management. And this, of course, is very important when the, the, the aging parent still lives at home. I have one friend who just could not get her mother to move out of her two-story house that, that uh, my friend had grown up in here in, in Santa Clara, California. And my friend had accepted a job down in Tucson, so she didn't live anywhere near her mother anymore and could not get her mother to agree to move out of that house. So she did the best she could to set up a system uh, using Skype, which was the best system at the time, a few years ago. And daily, she would Skype with her mother, and her mother would show her the medication sitting in the kitchen, and they would go, they would review it. Her, she would watch her mother take the medicine, make sure that, count the pills in the bottle. I think her mother, you know, had some minor resentment initially to this, but eventually she accepted it as a, a kind of a, a safety net for her. Uh, so they did a lot on Skype with this, but she helped her as best she could from long distance with the daily living. She hired people to come in and, and be with her mother. She made sure her mother was still communicating with the people in her church group so that there would actually be local help. At one point, she hired someone to come in and uh, do some cleaning a, a once every couple weeks. So she managed from afar, but it's very difficult, <clears throat> but that that is what children do. And often, if they're co-located, they'll come in and, and do it in person. Moving clockwise around the chart, legal representation is next. Often when people get into their late 80s and 90s, um, they <laughs> freely choose to have someone take over legal representation for them, and it's usually the one of the kids that would serve as a trustee or in, or plan to be the executor of the will most likely it's a child that's named on the advanced directive for health care hopefully they are having conversations about that but all of those kinds of things usually involve adult children sometimes it also involves it well, often it also involves paying some bills and handling of money when when a um, when an aging parent begins to find that that is too much of a chore or just too taxing or they move into an assisted living community where it's it's hard to continue to do that, one of the children will take over 
and pay those bills and keep track of the social security deposits and give give mom or dad enough money to 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 buy incidentals and things that they need and want wherever they're living if they're still living at home then often the one of the kids will come in and just help them on site sometimes resented by the parent but i see more often than not parents being willing to to share some of that burden and kids to, kids step in say moving along to management of real estate transactions when it's time for that big old house to be sold as it usually happens it's often the adult kids that come in and and take care of that which also leads to kind of uh, opposite position on the chart, the residential decisions and help with moving, usually that means moving into something more manageable, one level, one level living, either in a retirement community, a 55 plus community, or one with, with additional care. But again, it's the adult children that are generally heavily involved in that move. And of course, emotional support is critically important. I most most older people that I know that live live a much more isolated existence than they thought they would, but it is isolating, losing your ability to drive, losing your ability to to be as ambulatory as you used to be. Sometimes you're not ambulatory at all. So the emotional support of something, someone coming around to visit, one of the saddest things I read in the last year is how for so many older adults, Meals on Wheels is the only human being they see in a given day or a given week. And I thought that was so sad. And to me, I'm such a planner. To me, that was that was a, a planning fault. We have to, as solo agers, we have to plan where that emotional support is going to come from. And then finally, the last wedge of this pie that I haven't mentioned is investment and other financial decision making. Again, it's often the adult children that kind of rush in and, and help make those kinds of decisions about how to how the parents should manage their money in their later years. Now, yes, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, that opens the door to all kinds of, of elder abuse. And yes, it does. But no matter whether you have kids or not, we are all we will all get somewhat more vulnerable to elder abuse, and there are other ways to put checks and balances on that. So that's kind of a, a laundry list of things that we as solo agers need to figure out for ourselves. And I think it's also important to point out, because I think, I think this little pie chart, Sarah, is kind of a wake-up call for everybody anyway, of just thinking mm-hmm. about these areas that are important, whether you have kids or not. But I, I know we're going to shift in a minute to sort of, or, or maybe it would be good to talk about how, what are the things solo agers can do. And I actually do have a question from Donna from Texas okay. who says, if, if you want help with legal or real estate issues and don't have any living relatives, can you hire this out to an attorney or other type of professional? Yes, you can, and it depends on where you live. I'm going to be mentioning, actually, in the next slide, um, about the opportunity to hire a professional fiduciary. Now, I know that that is not available in all states. In fact, you say the term fiduciary, a professional fiduciary, and people in most areas don't even know what you're talking about. I brought In California, a few years ago, it actually became a licensed profession, and people have to go through two years of training to do that, and they're licensed, and they're you know, bonded, and they're, they're <laughs> the profession needs people, actually, if you know young people going into something of value. That's certainly something that is going to be widely, widely needed. In some cases, in some states, it's called a, a private guardian. But uh, it, this is not a perfect solution, but I am I am a big fan of it. And generally, attorneys, estate attorneys and elder law attorneys will know reputable fiduciaries and guardians that you can engage for this. My husband and I are going to be working with a fiduciary. I have several sets of friends, also solo agers, that have already engaged fiduciaries to work with them. Obviously, it makes sense to pick a fiduciary who's a good bit younger than you are. I always think of 40 as the perfect age for for a dentist, for a hairdresser, for a doctor, and for a fiduciary. 
Um, they're hopefully going to outlive me by a lot and maybe won't even retire by the time my days are up. So, so that's my current best, best recommendation for what to do. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about those. But what, what about another question that I've um, had from uh, friends and clients of mine who are solo agers is some people really have trouble even finding healthcare proxies and want to turn to a friend, but then that feels, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like that works. And so is this professional fiduciary someone who could be a healthcare proxy also? Yes, they absolutely can. And and in California, most are are fulfilling that role. It's going to be a whole new world in 10 to 15 years when baby boomers mm-hmm. and solo age or baby boomers start get really moving into a much older life. Mm-hmm. But they absolutely can fulfill that role. And I have seen with my own eyes recently, another mutual friend of Dory's and mine was named as by a friend as mm-hmm. the executor on her will, the an agent for health care, and agent or power of attorney for finances. Her friend died earlier than expected, very fast. She came down with pneumonia, and in four days, she had passed on. And our friend Mary was literally left holding the bag, wasn't able to actually make as much headway in the hospital as she would have liked because the the advanced directive had not been updated recently and there was a name wrong and it was quite a nightmare. But even once the initial nightmare was over with, this friend of ours spent a good part of the next eight months taking care of this woman's estate. It was practically a full-time job. So do we want to saddle our friends with that kind of thing? I I am looking askance at that now. It was a real eye-opener for both of us. And I now think that at the very least, if you have friends or, or well, nieces and nephews, family members are, are big candidates for this. If you have close ones that you trust, they're good candidates that I wouldn't lay the whole burden on any one. Right. You know, pick one for health care proxy, pick one for to be your uh, power of attorney for finances, pick another one to be the executor of your will. They can share the burden and there'll be some checks and balances along the way that will keep probably keep things a little healthier as mm-hmm. as a bonus. Great point. I have another question from Kendall from Arlington who says, how is the experience of solo aging different for men? Much of what you're saying depends on a certain outgoingness, a predisposition to connecting. Many men don't operate in this way. What advice do you have for them? He also has another yeah, question, but let's start with that one. Yeah, boy, Kendall, that is such a tough one. I And I'm starting to run into that more and more. <laughs> You know, I don't have any better suggestions than to than to say circumstances change and you've got to change with them. You may not have ever been a joiner, but it's time to find some friends. It's time to find a group of like-minded people. Base it around your love of movies. Cigars, woodworking, football, it doesn't matter what you base it around. Contemporary men, and I, I see really good examples around me, contemporary men are starting to reach out and, to other men and women and say, you know, we need each other. Let's start to get to know each other better and think about how we can support each other as we get older. I know exactly what you're talking about. It is so much harder for men. I've watched this over the last 10 years, I see it in my own husband. So, yeah, tough question, right. and the answer is not easy. Yep. And the second question from him is, what can we learn from other cultures about how to be an effective solo ager? Well, I think we can learn a lot from examples in Scandinavia, who several of those countries brought us co-housing. And I could not be a bigger fan of co-housing. I think it's a wonderful way to, for people to build community uh, with others, whether it's elder co-housing or multi-generational co-housing. It's uh, extremely important. If you're not someone's grandfather naturally, 
and you spend the last 10 to 20 years living in a co-housing community with kids running around, you may become a surrogate grand grandparent to a lot of people. You know, co-housing communi communities, I, I actually did a, one of these talks at a co-housing conference once, and we got into an excellent conversation of what do you sign up for when you sign up to be a friend or, or a helper? And, of course, people in co-housing, especially elder co-housing communities, run into this all the time. And you may find that people are quite happy to give you a ride to a doctor, to come in and help you help you get dressed, to come in and to take you somewhere, to visit with you. But what about when it comes down to more intimate kinds of help? What about toileting? Mm -hmm. What about helping you when you're really sick? And that's a pretty special that's a pretty special specialized kind of help that I don't know that most of us are comfortable relying on our friends for. But our friends are there to help bring other kind of help in, to know when we need an aid uh, a few hours a day, or to know when we need to move into a 24-7 community that's going to help us with the activities of daily living. So I hope that answered your question a little bit. And it does sound, I mean, our country, I mean, there's so much ageism. I mean, that's the whole other area, and it is it is difficult. I mean, I guess we should look to other cultures to find out what they're doing, but I'm still sort of thinking about what you were saying before in the, the example of the world shrinking so much, and which does lead me to, to want to ask you about what's, you know, in what way should solar ager, agers sort of start paying attention, you know, to to the planning, you know, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, because it, I mean, as you said, it changes. I'm even thinking of my own mother that, you know, after, so she and my father decided not to live in a, a retirement community because she decided, they decided at the last minute they didn't want to be around everybody of the same age. So they ended up, mm -hmm. even after much conversations with me, buying a house in a lovely neighborhood where there were young people, but there was no public transportation. This was out in California, oh. and you had to drive. And oh. so, you know, for a number of months, it was fine, and I had done my mm -hmm. best of talking with them, warning them, and all that stuff, and supporting them. But And then my father got sick and died, and then my mother um, was isolated, and her friends mm -hmm. couldn't drive at night, and she couldn't drive at yep. night, and she, you know, and we tried to get someone to move in to live with her, and it was just kind of mid-year and, you know, this was 30 years ago now and we, it was hard to do. And then she mm -hmm. came east and had a stroke and ended up back west. But, but it's just, you know, life changes. And, yeah. you know, and when you think about someone being alone, in this case, I was a resource sort of helping her, but just thinking about what that experience is like. If I mean, when you were giving the example of, you know, people planning to fly to see each other, I mean, even people who live near each other yeah. can't always count on people. So yes. I just wanted to throw that so, out and have your comments about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, there are, of course, there are the normal kinds of planning that everybody should do, whether you're a parent or a solo ager. And this next slide lists a number of those. I, I think everyone should see an elder law or a state attorney and <clears throat> at least put in place your powers of attorney for health care and finances, develop a trust if that's appropriate for your estate, and put together your advance directive for health care, either using the five wishes or some other document. Maybe your family physician has one that you want to use or your hospital has one you want to use. But those are, you know, those are the basic legal Mm -hmm. documents that you want to have in place. See a financial advisor. Really get an understanding of how much money you have to live, live on and what's feasible for you in terms of the rest of your life. If you, most financial advisors take plans out to <laughs> anywhere from uh, 96 to 103, and 103 isn't even enough these days for some people. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you're living within your means so that you can relax about that. Can, if you want to move into a retirement community, what kind of retirement community can you afford to move into? And then I mentioned I was going to talk more about engaging a professional fiduciary. I think that's very important. 
every attorney here in California knows and works with a, a core of fiduciaries. They all have their, you know, their favorites and their relationships with certain ones. I think that's – within the next five years, I hope to see that concept sweep the country because there's it's, it fills a huge, huge need especially for solo agers. You you also need to look at what insurance you have. Do you have a long-term care policy? Those are ex very expensive. They're almost impossible to get as you get older these days. It used to be not so hard. But the one comment I want to make about that is if you have a long-term care policy and you're waffling about it because it's going up in price, I strongly encourage you to keep it. It will give you so much more flexibility and, and be a, a big safety net underneath underneath you. You may need, well, you definitely will need to let your attorney know that you have that and your financial advisor know that you have that so that it, when the time comes, they can help you collect on it uh, when necessary. I know there's a couple of c continuous care communities out there uh, that will not even accept residents who don't have long-term care policies. Oh, really? Yeah, that's some things. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I I interviewed a couple people, and I spent all last summer interviewing people for this book, and I ran into a couple people who told me that. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. One was in Pennsylvania, and the other I think was in North Carolina. So anyway, those, those are those are my planning suggestions. Can you say yeah. a little more about the professional fiduciary? I'm assuming you're meaning it sort of like the best interests of the client fiduciary in that way. Is that I mean? Yes. But I may. Can you that's, just elaborate a little? That's what, yeah. That's what the term fiduciary means, and most of us have heard that term because in the last few years, financial advisors have had to proclaim themselves fiduciaries, meaning that everything they do is in the best interest of the client. What California and Arizona have done is create a profession called a fiduciary. And that person has been licensed and trained to literally make decisions when their clients cannot. I brought a fiduciary in to talk to a, another group that I'm active in here in Sonoma County. And amazingly, of about 60 people that were at this presentation, I think maybe five had ever even heard of a professional fiduciary before. And these were mostly people in their 50s and 60s. So it's only becoming known even in California, where it's now a licensed profession, it's even just now becoming known. But for one thing, they charge far less than in a, a typical fiduciary charges about a hundred and a quarter, hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty for their time by the hour, and most of it is back loaded. So we can here we can meet with a fiduciary for an hour and pay for an hour of their time to help them better understand us and what we want. We can talk about the documents we want to put their names on. And my plan is to meet with our fiduciary once a year just to bring her up to speed on what's going on. And we have some friends who are doing exactly the same thing. And we pay them an hour, an hour of their time. Where do they make their money? They make it on the back end. And attorneys use them quite a bit, to, both to save their clients' money and to save the attorney's time for things that really need their expertise. So so that's what they do. I think someone told me the other day that New York is getting very close, the state of New York is getting very mm -hmm. close to uh, licensing fiduciaries. And, and a couple of other states are looking at it. I hope they do it. So they will, a fiduciary will look at your... The fiduciary will look at your, your holdings, your estate, and make sure they're, it, it looks like on the back end you're going to have enough to pay them when they actually do their job. But the fiduciary might be the one that picks out the nursing home if you have to go into one that is your health care proxy if you need someone to make a decision. But that means that that person has got to get to know you very well, hence all the meetings. Well, and starting early, it sounds like, too, mm -hmm. probably important. Yeah, um, it's very important. Kind of not, not waiting till it's almost a crisis, if, if possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you you um, mentioned earlier, oh, no, I was just going to say, you mentioned earlier a little about living 
models and stuff. And what, you know, can you share some of your experiences of for solo agers? You know, mm-hmm. what factors to consider and all in terms of living situations well, as we get older. Yep. Yeah, let, uh, I will just say right up front, I am no fan of aging in place for solo agers. I'm just not. I mean, I know that's the trendy thing now, and I know AARP is all about helping people age in place, but the reality of aging in place for a solo ager is usually not very pretty. It's isolated. It's it's a, an actual recipe for isolation and loneliness. Now, it could be helped by joining a village. I hope most of the people on the call know what a a village is uh, that will help you with some services and bring you into contact with other people in the community and through events and helping you find vendors for things you need around your home. But do you really want to be doing that when you're 90? Hmm. I I don't get it. I know uh, so many people that say they're going to drag me out of here feet first. Right. But to to my way of thinking, it is not the right way to think about yeah. the la- the later years of your life. And I'm talking about your 80s, your 90s, and maybe beyond. Right. So the conventional living models are, you know, the 55-plus community, the assisted living communities, life care communities. There are – I'm fascinated by naturally occurring retirement communities. I think they're, that's a delight. My my current favorite NORC, naturally occurring retirement community, are mobile homes. Mm-hmm. I have run into some of the most wonderful mobile home communities that, you know, people can stay in for the rest of their lives because they've got people right within shouting distance of them. They're They're with each other. All the time, they're they're usually close to the services they need. They're almost all on bus lines. They I don't know I don't actually know whether you have the kind of preponderance of those mobile home communities at back east that we do in California just because of the weather. I know they have them in the southeast. Yeah, they have them in the um, southeast. There's less like in Massachusetts yeah. where I am. I mean, there probably are yeah. some, but it's a big thing in the like you know Florida south you know. South the southeast yeah. part because I think you're right. Occasionally, somewhat about the weather. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really all about the weather. Occasionally, you find a NORC in in a condominium complex or an apartment building. Right. People yeah. just moved in in their 30s and aged together, and there they all are. You know, that can kind of work. They can take care of each other. They're really close to one another, but. Aid is going to have to come in, and often these NORCs, people bond together and kind of create their own community and bring aid in for themselves and share the cost. So Mm -hmm. I've seen that happen. That's a great model when that can happen. It's almost like taking the village model but bringing it into the the condominium where you share, you know, maintenance costs, maybe caregiver, drivers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah, let me move on rather than saying too much more about that because I think probably your listeners know all about the conventional models. And maybe they know all about some of the uh, the new social living models, the co-housing, which I talked about earlier. Again, growing by leaps and bounds in the U.S. We have a ton of them in California, and I know you have some back east as well. They're growing all over the country. They're growing. There's several hundred of them around. We talked about the village concept some. I like the... Golden Girls model, and there's a couple of companies these days, my my favorite being Silver Nest, that pair people up. And it isn't always, you know, a 50- or 60-year-old opening their home to another 50- or 60-year-old. Sometimes it's pairing up with a college-age person. The Silver Nest as a company was developed in Boulder, Colorado, which, of course, is the home of Colorado University. And so they're having quite a bit of luck pairing up Seniors, usually the seniors have the home, and they want someone to come in for companionship and maybe help around the house, and an ideal candidate may be a college person so or someone just launching their career. So there's all kinds of opportunities to open up a home to multi-generations, to you know, a mono-generation, just for the, the help and support. And every rem- I think everybody remembers the Golden Girls show on TV where four women made their life together in Florida, and they didn't know each other when they first moved in. 
But they they grew to know and love each other over the years, and we enjoyed all their humor on TV. But it's it's a concept that is that is another kind of NORC, another kind of naturally occurring retirement community. If it is all people over fifty, and then of course we have tiny homes now, and who knows what's going to happen with the the minkas and the ALUs, the auxiliary living units. A lot of communities are opening their their minds to the idea that auxiliary living units ought to be available for people to put on their property if there's enough room so that they can have a, a caregiver live nearby or in some cases the an older person themselves wants to live in a small auxiliary living unit on the property of friends or relatives so so that's another that's a, another kind of a new social and living model that somehow I added to this chart and didn't show up but anyway <laughs> well actually Bill <laughs> Thomas just recently Bill Thomas yeah. recently was was on this program and yeah. talked about the tiny home yeah. I mean, model so and I many I people have heard about I, it. Yeah. I listened I listened to it and I know a lot of uh, people yeah. on the call probably did too it's a wonderful model I mean I can right. just see myself aging in one of those when a community of those with my friends maybe a little maybe a little idealistic but we'll see <laughs> I do encourage people to plan as a group. You know, get mm-hmm. together with the friends you have now. Especially, I want to get back to something Kendall said about being men being more challenged on this. It, it's a, especially important for men to start early to develop their social networks in their 50s and 60s and and into their early 70s. But you know, the earlier the better that you start to develop those networks and and broach the subject. You know, how would you like to plan together. Can we live near can we live near one another? Maybe you live kind of close now, but is there a way you could live closer? I have one friend who is a solo ager herself and interestingly enough, there were three girls in that family when they were young and the three women today that they became are all professionals and not one of them got married or had kids. They're scientists and doctors and business professionals, but they didn't have kids and they didn't get married. So now one of them has unfortunately was diagnosed about 10 years ago with early onset dementia. So they have already bought her a condominium in the same complex where the scientist is living. And then the the medical professional is looking for the next condominium to open up in that that's really a townhome mm-hmm. community, and she'll be buying in there too. They all want to live close to one another so that they can initially help this one sister, but then help each other as well. They're they're even thinking of buying a condiment, an additional one for a caregiver. So, you know, obviously that takes a few extra shekels, but they have that, <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's their plan for the future. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, I think that we have to get creative. Mm -hmm. Um, because the old models of growing old with family just aren't going to be there for solo agers. Sometimes they're not going to be there for parents. So we all need to think ahead and and not put our – and kick our heads out of the sand. Oh, I agree. I hope totally with what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. And then well, the other yeah. thing with the planning as a group, I just want to underscore of, you know, that planning as a group can also be, mm-hmm. you know, again, as you sort of said before, the sharing some of the resources. And, sure. you know, and it's it's just, it, it can be, you know, sort of just supportive of kind of building your family among friends. We, we had one yeah. um, couple who moved here from Baltimore to be near us and another couple. And unfortunately, the husband of the couple that moved here just died a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, we're able to, you know, really do what we all were talking about over the years and be there for each other. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's so, I mean, it's like, I mean, I really agree with just taking our heads out of the sand and not denying so that you begin to be more conscious and intentional of how you're living so that, you know, people can be there to support each other for friends. I mean, we, we, you know, friends are family. You know, we build friends as family. I always say, you know, my friends are my extended family. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel the same way, and that's what really prompted me to build this program and to write the book. <laughs> I was writing it for myself and so many of my friends. So many of my friends are solo agers. I don't know how that happened. I, you know, became a professional adult and never had kids, and so many of my friends are in that same situation. Mm-hmm. Mostly, but there are a few men out there that um, are in the same situation. And many men will be in that situation if they become widowed Mm -hmm. um, and they aren't close to their kids. So, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. So what are the obstacles, you think, for solo agers in particular, since that's the focus today of, you know, of really taking stock and, and, and planning? Well, I think the biggest obstacle is not knowing where to start, being in denial, keeping your head on the sand, thinking, you know, I'm just going to be happy, 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 dead. <laughs> and that, <Right. laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen for most of us. You know, my, my own, uh, my birth, my birth father, <laughs> uh, who I found when I was about 40, actually mm-hmm. had that, but he wasn't old enough in my opinion. But when he was about 72, mm-hmm. he was just standing up, doing something perfectly normal, natural. I think he was handing out menus at my at his son's restaurant. And the next minute, he was on the floor dead. <laughs> but, you know, that's not going to be the way it goes for most it of us. doesn't usually. Although Roger Landry's book, Live Long, Die Short, I mean, it, Yeah, well, it, that's the goal know, it would for be, sure. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, you know, those of us that are doing everything in our power to try and make that happen, we're just not that omnipotent. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 And I know you have like a checklist of of what solo agers should do. Maybe it would be good to kind of point that out. I know we're... It's really, it's really a recap of so many other things I've said. I would um, encourage people to just get active. Start looking around you. Find out what's happening in your community. Get active in the circles of people that su- support the aging community. Every, every county or parish or whatever your state calls the further <laughs> dissection of areas. Every one of them has um, a council on aging, an area agency on aging. Find out what's there. Find out what's available. You know, they for people who really can't afford to to put together even a basic estate plan, they have attorneys at those places, and usually they work on a sliding scale. Better start to to update your update your affairs with the experts. Mm-hmm. Revisit your financial advisor. Go see your attorney. If you haven't redone your estate plan in the last 10 years, it is so out of date that, that it wouldn't even be followed by a court of law. Mm-hmm. These things, things change, and they need updates. Explore the options. I, AA, I, I'm not a huge, huge fan of AARP, but I am a big fan of their website. And they have one of the richest, deepest websites I've ever seen. Every resource you could you could think of for a person over 50 is there on that website, mm-hmm. including lists of places you might live, including, you know, elder law attorneys in your area. It's just, it's amazing. Right. Get out and visit some communities. If you're, if you are, even <laughs> open the door a crack to the idea of moving into a retirement community, get out there and look at them. Go look at them near where you live. Go look at them near where you want to live and talk to people in there. Talk to people with some experience. Talk to people who have lived there for five years. See if they're happy. Go walk around and and see if people look happy if they're out doing things with others. So, yeah, I could go on and on. Great (laughs) advice. No, I mean, it's wonderful advice. And I just wanted to underscore what you said earlier, too, about, you know, that if people sort of stop the denial that, you know, when people get into their 80s or 90s or beyond, that aging in place is can be just too isolating. And, you know, one of the things that hits me as I'm listening to you, Sarah, is that, you know, if people plan ahead and maybe even if you're in your own home in your, say, 50s, 60s, even, you know, 70s, and get involved in like the villages if if that's available there and meet people because that may lead to the golden girls kind of concept mm-hmm. or yeah. you know the more intentional community that like really thinking about developing some new friendships that may help with the 
the housing situation, the support network as you get older. Been a solo ager all along or, you know, end up divorced or widowed or whatever. And that's another, that's another great, it's another great answer to Kendall's question about what about men. Mm -hmm. Join Mm -hmm. the nearby village. You know, if there's nothing else around that appeals to you to join, join the village. And or just the lifelong learning programs. I, I take a class at one, mm-hmm. and yeah. there are a lot of yeah. them in the class, and it's really nice to see that. Yeah, Ollie. I mean, always Ollie. more women, but there are right. some. Yeah, the Ollie programs, yeah. So yeah. I know we're a little bit over, but you said it was okay to go a little over. Yeah. You know, maybe tell the listeners again about your book, how to get it, and why they should buy it, what, who it would be good for. Sure. I think it's good for anyone who is a solo ager. All that I've talked about and much, much more is detailed in the book. There's a lot of uh, worksheets and checklists and guides for everything from preparing your house to aging in place, if that's what you insist on doing, to what is what is the village all about and resources for how to find one. So there's just so much more detail in the book than I could ever do in a presentation. Right. And so how can people reach you if they or to learn more about you? If What's your website and um, if you want to give your email? My business is called Life Encore. So I am Sarah, S-A-R-A, at lifeencore.com. And you can go to my website at lifeencore.com. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's such an important area. I mean, I really think that the planning aspect and thinking about the specific differences of solo agers, but also some of the commonalities. If you have kids and they're not around, you need to think about yourself as a solo ager and Mm -hmm. to do the kind of things that Sarah's talking about of really, you know, like uh, kind of wake up to that, you know, hopefully we're going to live a long life, and but that means needing to plan and needing to think ahead and needing to really be conscious about making sure we've got all of our I's dotted and T's crossed in terms of the the legal mm-hmm. kind of issues, but also the support part. I mean, you've stressed so much, and I think it's so true. The, the social connection is so important, and it can get more complicated as we get older. And you know, even if you're, even if you personally are not a solo ager, I have not run into anyone in years that didn't know a solo ager, have a solo ager in their family, or someone that they're close to that they've already maybe kind of thought to themselves, ooh, what's going to happen when that person gets older? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I think it's a wonderful gift to give. And I, you know, I know, you know, many solo agers who, you know, just what you started with of like, who's going to be there for me when I get old? And it's so important. It's not going to happen magically unless people start taking the steps to to create community and social connection and make some plans. So I think this is, I mean, the book is so well-timed. I think it's just terrific, and I'm so glad that it's going to be available for people. So that's great. Yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) But I just want to thank you so much for taking the time and being here. I just think that it's... um, it's really important. And as you said, I mean, just thinking back to the beginning of the statistics, there are a lot of solo agers, and it's going to be more so. And, I mean, I realize we didn't really talk about sometimes when people have children but not grandchildren and the, you know, issues when 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 they're away, too, or not available. And, I mean, you know, how one defines oneself is always so interesting. You know, I think it's just important. I mean, I think what you said is so true that people are solar agers agers themselves or they know of them or they're in their own family or they will be with them even if you aren't now. And it just can be very empowering to start thinking about it now. So thank you and good luck with all the book sales and all of that. And Always a pleasure to be on your show. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And I encourage you to check out Sarah's the book. So thanks again. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Sorry. again. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.